Hey everyone, I'm Katie Darrell, and today we are at home and social with the king of REO Speedwagon himself, Kevin Cronin. Thank you for being here. Wow, you know, I thought thank you uh, for having me, uh, Katie, the king of REO Speedwagon. King. Don't don't let Neil Dowdy hear that because he <laughs> is one of the founding members of the band, and we refer to him as the president. But I suppose, strictly speaking, the president, uh, so the king, I'm more of just a figurehead. He's just actually- a figurehead. The, you know, uh, you know, you just get to put your face on a coin here and nice. there. But listen, it's your voice. You are who we have fallen in love with over the years. Uh, you know, the ladies swoon over you. You could sing a love ballad and they're just like, oh, fainting. <laughs> well, that is kind of you. You know, we, um, you know, I write songs that, uh, that, that kind of stir my emotion. And, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough that people have uh, have related to it. And um, so we have this just this great relationship with our fans through our songs and and we uh, we nourish it as we tour around the country. And it's just it's funny. I was I was uh, with Richard Marks, my friend Richard Marks yesterday working on a song and we were talking about the special relationship that artists have with their audience and how much we kind of missed that uh, during the whole pandemic when we when we couldn't tour and how how amazing and how uh, how special it is when you get to come back on tour and you you know the first time I walked on stage after the pandemic it was I mean, it was emotional. I mean, yeah. Rich and I were both talking about how it literally brought us both to tears. And and uh, it's so it's really um, it's just great to be on on the comeback trail and looking at a big tour this summer. And uh, it's, uh, you know, our fans and us, babe, we uh, we've been at it for a long time and uh, I don't see it starting to wane at all. Well, yeah, I mean, you joined the band in 1972, and here we are, 2022. So many years, uh, so much experience, and so many fans that have been with you since day one, and they are flocking to this new tour. The tour is called uh, Live and Unzoomed, which I love the name of, and it's not just Ario Speedwagon. It's Styx and it's Loverboy. Um, how did you guys get this magical trio together? Well, you know, Tommy Shaw and I bumped into each other uh, back in 1999, it was at a, uh, at a at a charity event. Our dressing rooms were next door, and we had met before just on an airplane once. You know, our, our history goes back to when we were both playing in bars in Chicago. But um, and Tommy got the call to join Sticks, and I got the call to rejoin Ario Speedwagon within a few weeks of one another. But strangely, Ario Speedwagon and Styx had never shared the stage. We played with every other band known to man. But uh, and then Tom, Tommy, and I, uh, like I say, we met it uh, with, with, as we were dressing room neighbors. Uh, Tommy and his wife and Lisa and I went out to dinner at the Improv in Los Angeles, had a bunch of laughs, and by the end of the night, we were kind of going, "Wait a minute, we should we should get our bands together and tour." And since then, I think this summer will be our fifth uh, national tour, and they are kind of our best buddies in rock at this point. So that so that's a special relationship, and man, I uh, I treasure that. We've done so much, you know, we've done so much good charity work over the years, and uh, and then uh, Mike Reno from Loverboy and I yeah. toured Europe, right? Uh, it, just before the pandemic, we, uh, Mike and Ian Gillen from uh, Deep Purple and I toured Europe fronting a, a symphony orchestra, which was just unbelievable. And so Mike and I became uh, became buddies uh, over the over that tour. And so that kind of gave me the idea that you know. When when Ario and Sticks tour, we like to have that that third you know that third punch to really mm -hmm. make the tour something extra special. And we've toured we we've had Night Ranger in that spot, which was great. We had Thirty Eight Special one year, which was awesome. Uh, and this year we got Loverboy, who I love those guys. They're Hi. so you know the whole tour. It's going to be a love fest backstage, which. And that kind of energy, when everybody's, you know, f you know, feeling good on a personal level, and that there's no drama or anything, that that carries all over to the show, and and everybody's, uh, you know, just 
everybody, everyone in all the bands are psyched because we know that the other two bands are going to come out there and bring it every night. So it's, it's just, it's a good thing all around. Well, you talk about these rock and roll friendships that, that you've made and, and kept over the years. Uh, did, did you find that when we were all in quarantine and locked up, was it easier to reconnect with some of these friends um, because everyone was sitting at home bored? Like, did you, did you really like nurture some of these rock and roll friendships during that time? Well, you know, Tommy Shaw and I kept in contact. Tommy was, uh, was uh, putting together a podcast, <clears throat> excuse me, and I was doing my little songs and stories from Camp Cronin. And yeah. so we kind of uh, were guests on each other's shows. And, um, you know, honestly, during the pandemic, it, it was the first time in my adult life, I mean, since 1972, that I was actually able to experience the four seasons changing from my home with my wife and all three of my grown children moved back because of because the campuses closed down and the workplace closed down. So my daughter was working from home. The boys were studying from home. And so I had my whole family together. And so that was where most of my energy was was centered because it was just so great to, you know, because I can I can black out graduations and birthdays and, and anniversaries and stuff like that. But you can't black out when you're when one of your kids has a breakup or when, you know, when someone has a bad day and they, you know, you just bump into them, you know, in the hallway and you can just kind of tell that something's up. It's like, hey, you know, what's going on? And you end up sitting down and having a conversation. And those those moments, Katie, were just uh, they, they brought our family so, so close, all of us as adults. So um, so that's where my, you know, my energy was really family oriented during the uh, in fact, my daughter Holly and I did a, a little side project to, uh, called Holly Picks, where where she she picked my clothes, she picked the questions, she just like <laughs> roasted me every Saturday afternoon live and in person. She gave me a haircut because I, I had COVID hair for like six or seven months. And she's like, Dad, your hair looks horrible. Can I cut your hair? We're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it on camera. You We're know? doing it so, live. You know? <laughs> so yeah, so um, but you know, but I do treasure my rock and roll friendships as well. I mean, my friendships with the guys in sticks, uh, the guys in cheap trick the, I mean, I still get text, you know, these hilarious texts from Donnie Barnes from 38 special, you know, I, I hear from uh, from uh, uh, just, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to have uh, to have have a, a group of rock and roll buddies and just spending the, the day with Richard yesterday, um, you know, being the lead singer in bands, it's a there's not a lot of people that can really understand it to the degree that you do if it's what you do, you know, and so it was really nice to, uh, you know, like I say, spend the day writing with Richard, we came up with, I mean, Richard started us, we, we both started songs and then got together yesterday and totally blind. He started playing this thing he was working on. I'm like, wait, dude, that those are the same, that's the same key as this thing I got. And we, and it's just like this, you know, so when that kind of creative magic happens, you know, especially when, you, I mean, I've known Richard, Richard was, his first tour was opening for us, uh, you know, uh, in support of his first album back in 87. And we just have remained friends since. So, you know, yeah, that's uh, so many things that wouldn't have happened, but for being the lead singer on Ario Speedwagon. And I, I, I appreciate it every day. Well, Ario Speedwagon has so much going on right now. Obviously, there's the live and unzoomed tour, which goes through uh, like September. I mean, you are out there and you are doing it. But also, <laughs> let's talk about music and releases, or shall I say the re-release. Um, a Hidden Treasure, 1996 album, Building the Bridge, uh, just had a re-release. Give me the scoop on that. Yeah, so we, it was a weird thing. It, um, we were, we, uh, Epic, which was the label that we released all of our albums on the, in the 90s, they were interested in doing greatest hits packages and, you know, stuff like that, you know, compilation of our of our power ballads, which, which was nice they, they did a great job in that. And we put a couple of new songs on each one of them. But when it came to releasing an album of all new material, 
they just, you know, it was the mid 90s and classic rock was kind of, everyone left it for dead. So, so we uh, kind of basically self-released um, an album called Building the Bridge. And as a result of that, that album, it, it was, you know, it didn't get any promotion, it didn't get any airplay, it kind of just sat there. And it, because it wasn't on a, a real record label, it's, it wasn't available on iTunes, you couldn't get the CDs anywhere, you couldn't get vinyl anywhere. And, uh, but it's, it's the album that really uh, kind of solidified what I call the REO 2.1 lineup, which of course is Neil and Bruce and I, who have been together forever, but uh, Dave Amato and Brian Hitt, who have now been with us for 33 years, but at the time they were the new guys and they yeah. will always be the new guys, I'm sorry. But, uh, but so th that lineup really came together. And, uh, you know, I wrote a song with my freaking hero of all time, Stephen Stills, which was just, a, 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 I'm somehow, Katie, I swear to God, my daughter talks about manifesting and I, I never understood what that meant, but I had been manifesting, writing a song with Stephen Stills ever since his first solo album came out in like, I don't know, 1970 or something. And, uh, and then it happened, you know, so another thing that's just like, uh, in my surreal life. So this album, Building the Bridge, yeah, it was not available, couldn't get it anywhere, and now it's gonna be available on vinyl, CD, and and we're gonna and, be- And you can, out on tour though, you're gonna, people, right. audience members can grab it, and isn't part of the proceeds going towards charity? Yes, yes. Uh, w w what we do when we tour with Sticks is we always uh, uh, w w uh, connect with a local charity and they have local volunteers that come and kind of walk through the audience selling each one of our CDs, whichever one we choose. Uh, and the money goes to uh, to the Rock to the Rescue Foundation, which which Sticks and us founded uh, right after 9-11. And we put together our Rock to the Rescue 9-11 uh, concerts, which were unbelievable. Just, you know, the, a who's who of classic rock, you know, Journey, Leonard Skinner, Foreigner, Ario Sticks, uh, you know, the list goes on. But uh, so we do that every tour. And uh, so, so that be available this time so you can you know buy one of our cds and also uh you know feel like you're helping uh humanity a little bit in the in the you know at the same time when you're out on tour and you're up there on the stage which are your speed wagon song is the hardest to sing whether it be vocally or emotionally which one takes drains you <laughs> yeah you know i'm I've, I've made it my mission to not let this song drain me anymore because it's just, uh, the song is Can't Fight This Feeling. Naturally, it's our probably our most popular song worldwide. And uh, it's just, I wrote the song and I swear to God, I finished the song and, the, and I thought to myself, this song is gonna give me fits on tour. And I was right. And it's just, uh, but you know, I'm, my son Shane, who just graduated as a vocal music major at USC, we're very proud of Shane. He's got an amazing voice. He and his twin brother, Josh, uh, play in a band called Sir Please, and they are awesome. And actually Michael Lease, son of Howard Lease of Heart is in the band as well. Cool. Hugely talented kid. These kids are unbelievably musical. And but Shane turned me on to his vocal coach uh, from USC, a guy named Jeffrey Allen. And he was like, Dad, Jeffrey will change your life. You got to work with him. And I'm like, Shane, come on. You know, I'm an old dog. It's, I, I'm not going to learn any new tricks. And he Shane kept at me, you know, and finally I'm like, all right, started working with Jeffrey about a year and a half ago. And Katie, it has changed my life. And and he's really kind of shown me, no one ever really taught me how to sing. So I really didn't know what I was doing. I just wrote songs and just, you know, hope for the best. Right. <laughs> and uh, Jeffrey has really showed me how to, how to breathe correctly, all these little tricks that you can use. And it's just made me uh, so much more, uh, so much more, just having fun singing, you know, as opposed to kind of being, 
anxious about it. You know, now I walk out on stage and I'm like, let's go, you know, let, let's do this. And hey, you know, not a moment too soon because I got, you know, Tommy Shaw, Lawrence Gowan of Styx, you know, Mike Reno, who sings. Yeah, you got to keep up. All these guys sing their asses off. I, I you know, I, I would have looked like an idiot up there. But this year, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step right up and I'm gonna be right amongst them. So it's, I'm looking forward to it. Your 1980 album, High Infidelity, uh, spent 15 weeks at number one. And now you've, you've spoken a lot about your kids here today. Um, do those moments stick in your head like, oh, the first time you saw your, you know, a kid walk or talk, you know, do you remember those 15 weeks the same way a parent remembers special moments with a child? Or were you so busy that it almost is a fleeting memory? Well, it was, I, I remember it. I, I remember my whole career like it was, like it was, either, you know, could have been 50 years ago, or it could have been yesterday. It's a weird thing, Katie, that, you know, because I'm still doing the same thing now, as I was doing when I was 12 years old, and saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and went, that's what I want to do. And fortunately, somehow I was able to pull it off. But so there, there's this, there's this string that that attaches me to all every, uh, aspect of my career every era of my career so um yeah that 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 year 1981 was uh you you couldn't have asked for any more rock and roll dreams coming true than that year i mean we were the top selling band of the year we our concert tour was i mean everything we were just number one everywhere and uh it was an amazing feeling it got to the point where we would, you know, we would hear that our manager would call us up and tell us the chart numbers. And it was like, oh, yeah, we're number one again, you know, (laughs) and, uh, you know, and and it was it was just amazing. And, you know, when when you but but it was it was not just that album, because what happened is the one of the greatest things about High Infidelity was a lot of people thought that was our first album. But then with the as High Infidelity gained popularity, people started uh, discovering REO TWO and you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish and other albums. So so they all, you know, our whole catalog just, you know, got got new life breathed into it. And we literally, I I was just thinking about this recently. We had a, a span of nine platinum plus albums in a row. So, so there's a lot of people that that kind of came of age during that run and i think that really to a great degree is why um our our concerts are still such amazing experiences because so many people uh just experienced that music at those in, during those tender years of their life between junior high and off all, all the way through to college and you know, they'll, they say that the music that that uh, that gets into you between the ages of 12 and 16, it's it's just becomes part of your DNA. So we're very fortunate that we had a nice long run there in the 70s and 80s. But a run that continues, though, because I mean, nostalgia is so huge right now and classic rock, even when you look at all these superhero movies, they are doing so many throwback tunes. I mean, there is a whole group of 12 to 16 year olds right now that are really into vinyl, man. And this is a huge classic rock is huge. Like you're on top of the world again. (laughs) It's pretty amazing. I mean, we, you know, we when when Time for Me to Fly was used in Ozark season three, that it went back to number one, uh, you know, on in, in Billboard magazine, and you know, just even you know, silly stuff like our, you know, when Roll of the Changes was used in a, I think it was like a Ford truck commercial. Suddenly, this, you know, a lot of people are hearing that song for the first time, and uh, and and so, uh, you know, it, our songs get used in television shows all the time. I get I get calls and people going, yeah, I saw your song on. You know what? I can't even keep track of it all. It's sure. it's just, it's such a, and to me actually as a as a songwriter and as a as an artist, when when some you know, it, of course we're going to record our songs because there are songs. But when other people use them in their movie or in their TV show or their uh, product, you know, endorsement, commercial, whatever, when Sha- when Shaquille O'Neal saying "Keep on Loving You" in the shower. I literally, because I'm a huge NBA fan, a huge Laker fan, I literally, that was like the best usage ever. So things like that, you know, I, I get a kick out of that stuff big time. 
Oh my gosh, so awesome. All right, so the tour is called Live and Unzoomed. Uh, everyone can catch uh, tickets and see you out on the road with Styx uh, and with Loverboy. And while they're there, they can make sure they get their hands on the re-released album of Building the Bridge. Thank you so much for spending time with me today, Kevin. I appreciate it. Katie, it is always good to see you. You are just such a cheerful soul. And uh, <laughs> anytime, I, I, I'm here for you. I love the music. Yes, you do. Hey there, thanks for watching Access TV. Subscribe, follow, like, and do all the good stuff. And make sure you leave a comment below. I don't know, just let us know what your favorite Access TV show is or who your favorite bands are and what artists you're into, or just say hi, man. I'd like to be told hi. We love hearing from you. That's the point, all right? Keep it coming.